I just want to get rolling here for our Let Us Learn panel. Um, I'm Lachlan Whalen. I'm the sub for the evening, um, so bear with me here. I'll uh, first introduce our panelists here. Uh, to my right is Andrew Downs, Associate Professor of Political Science, the Director of Mike Downs Center for Indiana Politics, and the Indiana University Faculty Speaker. To his right is Rachel Heil, Associate Professor in the Department of English and Linguistics and the former co-chair of the USAP Committee. Uh, to her right, it's Janet Padilla, Professor and Director of Women's Studies Program and the former IU speaker, faculty speaker. And then last but not least is uh, Jeff Melanson, now Associate Professor, all right. Uh, Department of History and uh, currently presiding officer of the Fort Wayne Senate and member of the Budgetary Affairs Subcommittee. So, uh, welcome. Uh, this has been organized uh, by the Not In Our Future, a group of students, alumni, and the Fort Wayne community members organized around their concerns about the changes and damage to academic programs on IPFW's campus as a result of the USAP report and its recommendations. Uh, while there have been individuals and groups on campus concerned with the administration's plans for restructuring and eliminating academic programs for over a year, it's been the most recent series of events uh, that have led to a series of fa fairly dramatic reactions by students and faculty, student protests, the recent teaching, the letter-writing campaigns, etc., that have been noted by local media and have caused a splash on, on social media. So I know a lot of you are veterans here, but for those of you who aren't aware of uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about uh, in terms of the, uh, the way that the uh, events have unfolded, um, in particular, we're going to be referring to the September 19th memo from Carl Drummond, otherwise known as Review of Academic Programs and Departments in Response to USAP 2.2 and 2.3. So this was the memo that instructed departments and colleges to, to develop implementation plans based on recommendations in this document by the end of October. Um, also statements by Carl Drummond in the Senate on October 17th about the changes to the September 19th memo. Uh, this was the first notice to the campus community about the revision to that original September 19th plan and the mandatory cuts. Uh, one of the primary ones that we are going to talk about today is the infamous now uh, October 18th memo from Carl Drummond, also titled The Review of Academic Programs and Departments. So this document elaborated on Drummond's Senate comments about the nature of changes to the September 19th memo, which included an accelerated timeline for implementation and presented the non-negotiable cuts of programs, including, as most of you know here, French, geology, German, philosophy, and women's studies. So since the release of these documents, there's been a great deal of information and misinformation about what's actually taking place at IPFW, the nature of the decision-making process about the cuts, the impact of cuts, etc. So the goal of this panel is to provide a context for what has been happening on the IPFW campus in order and offer an explanation for the nature of the concerns of the individuals and groups that have been trying to argue against the proposed cuts. So let's actually start at the beginning. One of the things we see with the current discourse about the situation on campus is lots of acronyms like USAP and LSA. Some have also mentioned terms like the Dickinson model or the Dickinson prioritization process. So we're very fortunate to have on this panel some people who have been very involved with various aspects of the LSA and USAP process. So perhaps we can start with them to get some helpful uh, definitions of terms of the alphabet soup. So, um, LSA, USAP, um, Andy, do you want to start with that? I will go ahead and get started with LSA, and if people can hear me, I'll start passing the mic down because others will take it next. LSA is actually an abbreviation for something known as the Legislative Services Agency, which is sort of the administrative arm of the Indiana General Assembly. In 2015, the General Assembly passed a bill that did a couple of things. First, it actually created, by law, the classification of a university as a multi-system metropolitan university. That classification had not existed before, and if you go back and read what the classification says, here's a shocker, we're the only one in the state, because we are the only multi-system metropolitan university that meets the other criteria that, that uh, were put into the law. 
The second thing that it did was actually ask the Legislative Services Agency, which does research for the legislature quite frequently, to actually take a look at governance structures across the country to see if there was something that might be a better way to, to deal with our governance as well as our management agreement. Those are two separate things. And then the third thing that it did was create the IPFW Working Group. The IPFW Working Group uh, was a, a group of people, representatives from Purdue, from IU, from IPFW, from the community. They were supposed to get together and talk about what it is that, uh, that results in challenges here at IPFW and then make recommendations. Theoretically, the LSA report and the working group uh, information would have been related to one another, although not the same thing. And a decision was made pretty early on for those two to be turned basically into one document so that no one would have to go searching for one and, and, and maybe not realize the other existed. I was actually on the IPFW working group as the uh, now former presiding officer, so that's some fun that Jeff will get uh, to look forward to if they do this again. <laughs> The working group began meeting over the summer uh, of 2016, talk, talk actually technically even in the spring, talking about a variety of subjects, pardon? 15, sorry, 15, thank you. Talking about a variety of things, uh, including what worked and did not work at IPFW. Uh, partway through the process, a proposal emerged. Uh, it's a proposal that came from basically uh, two members of the boards of trustees, one from each university, that suggested that IPFW should be split into two entities. One, a health sciences campus, that would be Fort Ware, uh, the IU Fort Health Sciences Fort Wayne campus. And the other would be Purdue Fort Wayne or Purdue Northeast or whatever you want to call it, and everything else would become that. That suggestion uh, was sort of sprung on the working group. Uh, there were two people who voted against that, the total of the recommendations. They are Chancellor Carwine and me. If you read through all the recommendations, there are actually 20 some of them, 23 I think. A number of them made sense, for example, having one transcript system as opposed to the two we have to run now. Uh, some investment from the parent campuses that we believe would have been good. But for the two of us, the idea of splitting the campus up was sort of a non-starter. And it's something that uh, other members of the of the working group decided uh, was actually the starting place and, uh, and their votes carried the day. And so that is, when people say LSA, they're typically referring to the report that came out and that report was the research done by LSA as well as the recommendations of the working group. You may know that uh, people in the College of Arts and Sciences actually authored a response to that particular report. It pointed out that some of the data was inappropriate, in other words, uh, not right for doing the sort of analysis that they said they were doing, and some of it uh, sort of misrepresented what was happening here on this campus. And that is your very uh, brief, given what I could do, uh, explanation of LSA. I'm in danger of not being brief, um, <laughs> but I'm going to try. The, the problem, I think, is that for a lot of people in the community and a lot of people on campus, it seems like something has happened very suddenly, but it's not at all sudden. Uh, this has been in the works for about four years. Um, so I'm going to go back four years, and then I'll try to keep moving, and I'll try not to be too boring. Um, because four years ago, uh, before a lot of you were students here, we had a very bad year financially here. Um, we had reached sort of a high of enrollment. You've heard a lot recently about how our enrollment has decreased by 30% since 2011, but what is often not mentioned, um, except by people who are sort of pushing against these cuts, is that 2011 was a high water mark. There was an enormous increase in enrollment because of the, the problems in the economy nationally. So uh, we were not prepared for the rainy day that followed the high water mark. And so 2012-13 uh, was a very bad budget year. There was a lot of sort of like, the sky is falling, we need to jettison things, you know, as though you were on a sinking ship and people are jettisoning ballots and they're just throwing anything off the ship that they can find, even things that, you know, are really useful things. Um, so there were a lot of positions that weren't filled, people were getting fired, and um, at the time, the sort of uh, encouraging thing that people would say was, don't worry, these aren't strategic cuts. 
which always I thought was hilarious because that wasn't at all supportive and encouraging to me because it just seemed like no one knew what was going on and we were just like trying crazily to save some money. Um, so after that, the following year, 2013, 2014, Stan Davis was the uh, interim vice chancellor for financial and administrative affairs. And I think we can all agree that that kind of non-strategic cuts is a bad idea for a long-term strategy. Um, but what he lit upon as the way of solving things and being more strategic was the work of uh, Robert Dickinson, who wrote this book called Prioritizing Academic Programs and Services. And he is, he, I'm sure he makes a lot of money running these seminars where college administrators come and learn about how they can figure out what the best academic programs to cut are. Um, so Stan Davis spearheaded this in the 2012, no, 2013-14 academic year. Eventually, um, and, you know, Vice Chancellor Carl Drummond has taken full responsibility, said this is totally an academic affairs, I take full responsibility for these. But it did start as a way of trying to get things a little more uh, thoughtful about how we were dealing with, with the budget. So, um, so this was going to happen. Several people from IPW were sent to one of these seminars that Robert Dickinson puts on and uh, came back ready to implement this. And yet they discovered when they got back here that our data systems weren't really in good enough order to do the kinds of analysis that Dickinson recommends. So um, suddenly it turned into, well, we're going to build something that works for us with the kind of data systems that we have. And what this sort of looked like in the first year, there, there, were, there were two years of the USAP process, and I was on the first year. And what this ended up sort of looking like to those of us who were feeling optimistic, or those of us who thought that Dickinson looked like kind of a disaster, um, it looked like, well, maybe we can make this something that is helpful. Maybe this could be something that will, um, because you know, many organizations could improve. IPW could improve. There are a lot of things that are done here that are very inefficient. There are things that are done here that are just done this way because they've been done for 15 or 20 years. There's a lot of ways that as an organization we can improve. And so there was a fair amount of optimism that first year of thinking, maybe if we're not following Dickinson like a Bible, we could come up with something that's really useful. Um, I don't believe that, that happened. And so uh, when we put together this university strategic alignment process, the idea was that it wasn't about prioritization. That's the big Dickinson word is prioritization where, you know, the, the best ones are going to live and the bottom ones are going to die. Um, instead, we were looking at alignment, alignment with the strategic plan. And that's much more sort of kind and gentle than the idea that the bottom fifth of programs is going to be um, ended. So what this meant, and I, I'm, I'm maybe halfway done what I'm going to say um, before I turn it over to someone else. Uh, what this meant that, was that some of the things that Dickinson included in his program that safeguarded certain ideals of faculty governance and faculty control over the curriculum got left behind because we weren't doing prioritization, so we weren't going to be cutting programs, so we didn't have to worry about how, like, in the Dickinson process, Academic professors are the ones who are dealing with academic programs. Staff members are the ones who are dealing with support services, you know, like advising or financial aid or whatever. Um, but because we weren't doing that, and there was a lot of like warm, fuzzy feelings, we banded together and said, okay, instead of two task force with 12 people on each, we're going to be one large group of 24. And what that meant, though, in the second year is that you did have non-professors who who are not, you know, according to generations of tradition, the sort of guardians of the curriculum, you had them making decisions on what needed to be cut and what not. So that's a way that uh, the process diverged from Dickinson in a way that I think is bad for, um, for ideals of faculty ownership of the curriculum. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think it's worth stating explicitly that despite the fact that we take in tuition dollars and we pay it out for programs and services and we have to balance the budget, uh, this is not, I do not believe that education should be a capitalist endeavor. I don't believe that the administrators are managers and that we are uh, producers of widgets. I mean, the ideal that goes back centuries is that the university is the faculty because the faculty members have the stuff up here that needs to be transmitted, not through a process of pouring things in, but through a process of students doing the work 
to access, you know, that it's a, it's a meeting of minds, it's not the production of widgets. So, um, so that's where the ideal of faculty ownership of the curriculum comes from, and I think it's very important. I think that that has been really almost entirely lost in recent decisions, and that started with the USAP process a couple years ago. I'll stop now. I want to do one thing, and that's to point out that the work of the LSA and the work of USAP did not start connected to one another. And for quite some time, the administration said they are not connected to one another. However, when the Purdue and IU boards of trustees met this past June, they signed a new management agreement that extended things for a little while here at IPFW, and they cited the USAP report in the new management agreement. And the new management agreement basically says they're trying to work out the details of the LSA recommendations. So even though they may not have started out merged, because groups have, especially you know, outside folks who look at the USAP process and say, oh, that looks wonderfully inclusive, it's, it was driven by people on the campus, uh, the recommendations uh, seem logical, people have drawn those two together, and so now they are linked together in the minds, at least, of the Purdue Board of Trustees. Do I need this? Probably. Uh, so, uh, one of the things I would add to um, what's been said so far is this question of how we got from Dickinson to where we are now. And one of the things that's important is to recognize, um, so as a faculty leader, so when we talk about faculty leaders, we're talking about the IU speaker, the Purdue speaker, and the um, presiding officer of the Fort Wayne Senate. So, um, our charge as faculty leaders has been to sort of participate in conversations about um, all of these issues such as USAP and LSA, but so somewhere I would say between year one and year two of USAP, um, there was an introduction of a new phrase which was program viability. And that really comes out strongly, you could see that in the year two USAP report where um, the Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs is now charged with coming up with a system system of judging program viability. So I don't know if that's Dickinson's prioritization model necessarily, but you could see hints within the language about viability towards that. Um, so one of, personally, and I'm just going to speak for me as the former IU speaker, one of my goals was to make sure that if we were going to go down this path of judging program viability, that we were doing it in a way that was fair and um, took into account more than simply what we might think of as floors, right? So like minimum things that you would have to have to be considered viable. Um, and I, I was coming, my sort of approach to this question was very much informed by the fact that I remember when Mitch Daniels first became president of Purdue University, in one of his radio addresses, he actually um, talked about, um, he had singled out majors that have less than five graduates a year, have no business existing. And I wish I could find for you where that particular radio address was, but it was also around the same time that he said regional campuses shouldn't be doing research. So it was, um, he, he came into his presidency in quite a, um, uh, uh, with quite a splash saying some of these things. But, so anyway, so as a faculty leader, one of the, one of the um, influences we tried to have was in shaping this conversation about program viability. And so it's interesting to think about how we got from the process we were in, which was a fairly complex set of metrics for, for judging whether a particular program, or in this case, you know, a major, was viable. Um, and I actually sat in meetings in which, in, in which we had extensive conversations about how being small shouldn't be conflated with being inefficient, right? You could graduate 50 majors a year, but be very inefficient. You could, be, you could graduate two majors a year, but do it very efficiently. Um, and so we had conversations like this regularly. 
Um, and I think that when you look at the actual program viability metrics that were distributed with the September 19th report, you can see the influence that a lot of that um, constructive criticism had on the process. Now, when we get back to the October 19th report, though, what's important is that I still do, could not tell you what metrics were used in deciding, um, for, in deciding upon the cuts that were made. So one of the uh, metrics that you may have heard is simply they graduate less than five majors a year. So I know that's come up in a couple of interviews with Drummond on the news. Um, it's interesting, right, because that's how I've learned about it, is through the news. So there's been no communication um, from the administration downward. Um, but then the second metric that you may have heard, the chancellor has used it in some of her public statements, is declining enrollments. So you were small in number, but you also were declining. Um, we have never been presented with, you know, sets of data or anything that would allow us to judge um, what exactly, how exactly viability was measured. Um, so a lot of, you know, the complaining, the, the whinings, if you will, the, for those of you who have that perspective, comes from the fact that there was a process, we participated in good faith, and then the whole process was jettisoned um, for the um, October 18th recommendations. So I'll, I'll stop there for <laughs> so maybe that's an appropriate place to ask the, the question that Janet used the term whiny and that variance of that, slightly more politic versions of that have appeared out in, in public statements. So can I'd be interested to hear what the rest of the panel suggests. What is at stake here if it's not just whiny faculty members with their personal problems? So what is at stake? Um, why are so many faculty whose jobs are not directly affected so concerned about what's ha been happening here? Um, I will say something on, on this, and I'm going to start with something. I'm sure my colleagues up here are going to talk about the importance of liberal education, the importance of diverse academic programming. But I want to start with something a little bit different, and it's the idea of shared governance. And Rachel actually touched upon this a little bit in talking about uh, the idea of faculty being the ones to evaluate uh, curricular decisions and things like that. Um, in higher education at universities, faculty, um, administrators and academic and school presidents, and then boards of trustees are the three main pillars of what we refer to as shared governance, shared decision making at a university. Um, ultimately, boards of trustees are the ones who have final responsibility for what takes place at a university. Um, but it is the administration, the president, in our case the chancellor, and it is the faculty um, who are primarily responsible for what takes place in the day-to-day -day operations of a university. And the faculty occupy a very special place at a university because, as Rachel alluded to, without a faculty, there is no university. Without a faculty, there is no instruction. Without a faculty, there is no creation of knowledge and sharing of knowledge. Without a faculty, there isn't, there isn't a university. Um, I emphasize this point because from the very beginning of USAP, true shared governance was not taking place. Um, faculty were on the USAP task force, but they were appointed by the administration. In the first year, the faculty on the USAP task force uh, roughly mirrored the faculty distribution across campus. Uh, the College of Arts and Sciences is the largest college and had the most members on the USAP task force. Uh, the administration worked, at least theoretically, with the faculty leaders to identify the faculty who participate in the task force. In the second year, though, the chancellor seemingly working on her own, picked the faculty that would be on the task force. And the, and the composition of the task force did not mirror the distribution of faculty across campus. So the College of Arts and Sciences, the biggest college at IPFW, about 40 to 45 percent of our faculty, had one and a half faculty members uh, on this 12-member task force. The, the bigger problem, though, is that moving through, I mean, Janet mentioned the good faith effort working with uh, Vice Chancellor Drummond in the summer and fall to try and work toward a resolution that could meet everyone's demands. The Board of Trustees, the Purdue University Board of Trustees steps, in, in, steps into this in the middle of October and demands greater cuts. And they demand greater cuts in a way that basically throws any concept of shared governance out the window. They don't say, all right, go back to your campus and talk to your faculty and figure out and say, this is, we need to cut this much. How are we going to do it? How are we going to protect academic programming to accomplish that? They just said, you need to make more cuts. Make them. We don't care who complains. We don't care what gets said. We don't, get, we don't care what the impact is going to be. 
And so shared governance and any sort of kind of curricular decision making for what we want our university to be is completely out the window. And I think that's a really important thing that's at stake in this, is the ability of the faculty to decide what the university should be is being severely jeopardized by the decision making that's been taking place. So a question from your perspective. So did the Purdue Board of Trustees ever give a target for the cuts? So in other words, was there a, a number of programs that had to be cut? Was there a dollar amount to what had to be cut? Or they just were asking for cuts? My understanding of it is that there were never specific programs named, there were never specific numbers given, there certainly were not dollar amount targets provided, there was a concept of, of the magnitude of cuts that needed to be accomplished and the purposes behind those cuts, and we can talk about that later, um, but there was not a specific, my understanding is that there was no specific target agreed upon at that meeting. Now I should point out that Jeff and I were told about this, we, since we are part of the faculty leadership at this point, we were in a meeting with the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, he told us what took place in the executive session of the Board of Trustees. The members of the board are familiar with USAP, and USAP actually made some recommendations about program restructuring, as it was called. And then they're also familiar with the September, uh, I forget the date, thank September, you. thank you, September 19th uh, report from Vice Chancellor Drummond. So they knew uh, sort of the scope of what had been discussed. And the message that uh, Carl would say was clearly delivered was, this is not enough. They didn't say, go find four more, two more, ten more, go find five dollars more, five million dollars more. They simply said, this is not enough. At Purdue, one of the terms that they use is efficiency, which is, you know, you sort of expect. You spend time with engineers, and they like talking about efficiency. And so they like to talk about efficiency within academic structure. That's a, that's a term that will vary from place to place, and I think if we were to actually ask you all to write down what you would, how you would define efficiency within an academic setting, we'd probably end up with you know, 20 or 30 different versions of what efficiency means, but the Purdue Board of Trustees is very conscious of this term that they throw around. I'm not sure if it, I guess this is okay. Um, my department is not directly affected by these cuts, um, other than that we are going to be welcoming some colleagues into our department because um, the programs... No. The programs that are being cut, the departments that are being dissolved, individual faculty members have to go find a new home. Um, so we'll be taking some in. That will affect our department a little bit, but it, it, that's not... It's not that big a deal. Um, I think the big deal, the reason that a lot of people in departments and programs that are not affected are concerned is partly, I mean, building off of what Jeff said about shared governance and about who gets to make decisions, uh, specifically about the curriculum and about, uh, the, about the curriculum, but how the curriculum is structured and what we do is part of our mission. And I think that the, the larger concern is that the chancellor or the board of trustees or both want to change the mission of this university. Um, that's my read of the situation, that there is an effort underway to change the mission of the university without actually changing the written mission of the university. And it's really hard to argue against something that is not explicit like that. So, um, you know, I mean, in the Dickinson model, you're supposed to have taken care of, of some other things, like, you know, he's like, when well, you've tried everything, you've gotten rid of everything, when you've cut all that you can cut, and you can't cut no more until you cut programs. Buy my book. But we didn't do that. We haven't done that. We haven't done that kind of search for what efficiency means to us. So we went from the sky is falling, we're out of money, what are we going to do? Fire people left and right, don't fill positions, oh my god, to, well, I guess we better cut some academic programs. And USAP was supposed to be looking at efficiencies, but it's actually really hard to look at 
financial and budget efficiencies for people who do something that you don't really understand that well. I mean, if you can imagine going into somebody else's house and telling them how they're spending their, well, you just tell them about the coffee. Don't, don't buy your coffee at Starbucks, whatever. Um, but for, for a unit that does something radically different from what you do, um, where there aren't any benchmarks that tell you, oh, it should cost this or it should cost that, it's actually extremely complex and we haven't done that at IPFW. So that job hasn't been done. And so when the quickest, easiest thing to do was to look at academic programs, that's why I think that this is about changing the mission. Because there were other things that could have been looked at in terms of how we spend our money. That examination hasn't been done. And so it seems to me that there must be some sort of ideological reason for cutting academic programs. And I think it's related to wanting us to be a different kind of school. And you know, eventually they'll change the mission statement, eventually uh, when we have changed into a different kind of university. So that's why I feel concerned, um, even though my major is not at present going away. I, I want to throw in one quick thing. Jeff said eventually one of us will talk about it. We've hinted at it, somewhat stated it explicitly, but let's be very explicit. A lot of people look at IPFW as a regional comprehensive university. That's what we call ourselves, a regional comprehensive university. And if you are a comprehensive university, that means you are doing things other than art, other than engineering, other than business, other than, you do it all. That's, that's the nature of comprehensive. And the question becomes, at what point are you no longer comprehensive? Uh, and that's a question to get at what Rachel was saying. We've never really had that conversation. Not only do we not talk about what it means to be efficient or define that for ourselves, uh, but we never decided what we wanted to be. Do we want to be a regional comprehensive? If we do, then you figure out a way to make things work. If you decide that you don't want to be a regional comprehensive, then fine, figure out how to do that as well. But that, that's, that's where, and you know, it's been said somewhat publicly by both Jeff and me, and. Janet, when she was the speaker as well, we have not really been functioning under a clear vision. And we should, for the moment, uh, point out that when Chancellor Carwine came to the university, she started in September, and that was when we found out that we were running in the red. So she basically walked into a very bad situation. And uh, she kept saying we should not make cuts of convenience, we should not make cuts of convenience. But in that first year, that's what we were sort of faced with. Then there were estimates of what might happen in years out, and unfortunately those estimates ended up being wrong for another four years in a row, which is why for the fifth year in a row, when we all came back to campus, we got to be entertained by calls for additional cuts. Uh, and these were cuts that had to be made in order to get into the black. Not in order to become more efficient, but to get into the black, quite simply. One thing you might have noticed, though, in the, um, in the language coming out or the statements coming out of the central administration on campus, though, is, a, is very much a contradiction, right? Where we have been told in one document that these are cuts that have to do with the fact that we have a budget deficit, right? That we are spending more than we can afford because of our declining enrollments. And so we're doing these cuts to save money. But then in another statement, say the next day, you will hear the, um, the idea of strategic alignment. That we made these cuts because we're going to take that money and we're going to invest it in high demand programs or in new programs, right? And so I think that you know, if you've been paying attention, right, what you're going to see is that both of those things can't be true, right? So do we have a financial crisis or not? And I think that, you know, I don't know if anybody was at the teach-in last week when Dr. Borbieva talked about crisis discourse, but her speech was very powerful. And one of the things she talked about is the way an administration can create and manufacture a crisis um, and use that discourse of crisis in order to justify making decisions without shared governance, in order to justify pushing, pushing forward with their agenda um, without full participation, without sort of full input from the community, not just from campus, but from the community. Um, and it's interesting to see, so IPFW is not alone in this. If you, if you want to learn a little bit about what's going on um, nationally, particularly at campuses not unlike ours, so regional campuses, go and look at what happened at University of Akron in Ohio, um, where the president nearly 
single-handedly tried to turn University of Akron, which has always been a comprehensive public regional university, into a tech and vocational school. He had um, pushed for a new name. He, did, I, did anybody remember the name? Was it, was it Akron? Well, oh, I, anyway, it had, it had tech in the name. Um, but he, had, he was pushing for all of these major changes to the mission of the university, one that narrowed it significantly um, without the actual input of the stakeholders, which are the students, the faculty, the community. Um, he's no longer there, if I recall. Um, so, so with a lot of pushback, the University of Akron is now back on its mission of being a comprehensive university, but this is happening. Um, and if you saw the film Tuesday Night Starving the Beast, you know that there's a there's sort of powerful forces driving these kinds of changes. There are forces that are informed by ideologies that don't see public education as a public good, but see it as something that is designed to contribute to the workforce and to um, uh, enhance the economy of the region as opposed to, say, create good citizens and quality of life and all of that other stuff that we've so long in our history associated with um, higher education, particularly liberal arts education. So I'll... Do, do you want to... Uh, certainly one measure of efficiency is the amount of money that programs generate for the university. Do you guys want to comment on... Because, again, it's... You often hear it represented in the media that these programs somehow don't pull their weight. What sort of funds are generated by the programs in question? Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to answer that, but I'm going to do the academic thing and not answer that first. Okay. I'm going to answer. I'm actually going to address uh, Janet's point. So Janet mentions that in the media you see two different rationalizations being offered for why these cuts are being made. Um, we have a budget deficit this year, which we do, um, which needs to be addressed and is being addressed. Um, the cuts we're making will do nothing to solve that budget deficit. We've actually solved that budget deficit completely independently of any of the cuts we are currently making. Um, and then two, the strategic alignment moving forward, um, we're not saving enough money that we can really do any sort of meaningful investment in anything else by these cuts that we're making. So that's, that's not actually part of it either. So, but, we, but the other problem we face is that when we were working on our internal process, Part of the goal of cost savings really was about trying to address short-term budget deficits. The Purdue Board of Trustees does not care about IPFW's short-term budget deficits. They did not come in at, when they came in to say, we really care about the one and a half million dollar, two million dollar deficit you have this year. You need to make these cuts to address that problem. That was not their concern at all. Their concern, and this gets to this one version of this idea of efficiency that we keep talking about, their concern was that we have too many programs that have too few graduates and that feature highly paid tenure line faculty, tenured faculty teaching low enrolling classes. Um, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to pick on French because French is here and, and I love Nancy and Nancy's gonna love me. Um, and, 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 but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm exaggerating the numbers, okay? So I'm not using actual numbers for French, I'm just using an exaggerated picture. And part of it is because I think Purdue exists in this world where the real numbers matter less than this exaggerated picture. Okay, so French has two full-time uh, tenured faculty members. Let's say for the purposes of our example that the two tenured faculty members in French make a combined $180,000 a year when you include their benefits, okay? So we're paying $180,000 a year. IPFW is investing $180,000 a year um, so uh, that Nancy and her colleague can teach classes of 10 or 15 students each, okay? Um, and they're gonna graduate three or four students a year. All right, and that's how we're using that money. Um, their argument is we could take that money away from French we could hire one or two new engineering professors or business professors or nursing professors, if nursing actually still existed here a year from now. Um, and we could then have those people teaching classes of 30 and 40 students, and they, those could be contributing to programs graduating um, 50 or 100 students a year. And so if you're talking about the, the efficient use of economic resources, it makes far more sense to invest in instructors who are going to be teaching large classes with large numbers of graduates each year, right? That has nothing to do with education. That has nothing to do with the idea of a comprehensive university. That just has to do with business. 
And, and keep in mind that the people who are appointed to boards of trustees in the vast majority of cases, and I think almost universally in Purdue's case, are successful businessmen. And so that's the way they're approaching this. They're not thinking about it in terms of education. They're not thinking about it in terms of opportunity. They're not thinking about it in terms of um, the liberal arts or anything else. They're thinking about it in terms of the efficient use of economic resources, the efficient use of scarce economic resources. Now, to get to, to Lachlan's question, um, I'm going to simultaneously make an important point and then dash that point almost instantly, because um, we're good at that. So um, every program, by the data sets that USAP had, Every program that is currently being eliminated um, generated far more revenue for the university in excess of costs to the university. Um, so, you know, the number of credit hours that they're generating um, more than pays for their operations. All right, so you can go to ipfw.edu slash USAP, and over on the left-hand side, you can find a, 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 a link called Performance Measures, and you can pull up these performance measures and look for look by college and look by department and see what their revenues are and see what their expenses are. And there's only one department on campus that doesn't pay for itself based upon those measures. Engineering. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so this is important to note, that when you're talking about the efficient use of economic resources, these departments are all paying for themselves. There's a, and so that's the yay, good information. Now here's the part where I shit on that. Excuse the language. Um, one, the vast majority of classes offered in these departments are general education classes. And so the revenues generated in those cases, the idea is that if you eliminate the philosophy department, the revenue generated on general education classes now in philosophy will be generated in other departments. Again, that logic has nothing to do with educational opportunity or anything else. It's just, again, businessmen. The other significant problem is that IPFW, the entire Purdue system, does not track revenue by unit. The numbers in the USAP performance measures are made up. Okay? And what I mean by that is when... Most of you, many of you are students in here, alumni in here, so you've had the experience of going online, going to the bursar's office, whatever, paying your bill. When you pay for your five classes, your 15 credit hours, the bursar isn't back there going, okay, you took one history class, that's three credit hours times this much, uh, that goes to the history department. And you, and you took a nursing class, and so this much goes to the nursing department. And I don't know any students who are taking nursing and history classes, but whatever. So, we don't do that. We're not required to do that. It doesn't, the, that information has never actually mattered in terms of our budget. And you might think, but you've got credit hours and you've got a tuition rate, so what difference does it make? Well, the problem is not everyone pays the same amount in tuition. You've got out-of-state students. You've got students who are on scholarships. So technically, if a student's got a scholarship, none of that money is actually coming to IPFW in most cases. It already exists somewhere in our budget. Some students, for a variety of reasons, pay discounted tuition rates. So the numbers are just an approximation of reality. They're a rough guess that no one quite knows other than maybe the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. No one quite knows how those numbers were generated, but they're made up. I'm not saying that the philosophy department, which generated a million and a half dollars in pure revenue for the university, I'm not saying that they're really running in the red, but we don't actually know how much, how much money any of these programs made or didn't make which calls into question the entire decision-making process. Because if you're using false information or made-up information in one part, then how are you justifying the rest of what you're doing? How are you justifying the validity of these permanent changes you're making at the university if you've got information that is just kind of like, this is a rough guess at how much money these programs might generate if that was actually a thing we tracked. So that's a variety of useful and disappointing and whatever news. <laughs> So one thing I would add to that, and, and I think it just echoes your broader point that, you know, obviously, you know, if somebody's going around saying, oh my gosh, French and women's cities, they lose the university money, right? To me, coming back and saying, actually, do you see what we do with general education? Do you see how much revenue we actually produce is a valid counter argument. But one, the, the, the better counter argument is, guess what? All of your education is subsidized. There's not one student here who's actually paying the true value of what their education costs. It's being subsidized by tax dollars, by donations, whatever. But more importantly, that the university overall is in the business of, of sus subsidizing things that aren't profitable. It's what we do. Do you think running the library is profitable? 
It is not, right? <laughs> it, is the, it is the cost we pay to be a university. You have to have a good library. So, you know, you could extend that same logic to any major, you know, so engineering doesn't generate enough to pay for itself, but I don't think anybody would start arguing that we shouldn't have, you know, an engineering major at IPFW. So what we have to do, what we should be doing, is thinking about the mission of the university and how our programs fit in or align with that mission. And one of the frustrating things, I think, for a lot of us is we actually have a very clear mission as a university. It's Strategic Plan 2020. And, and what came out of the USAP process, um, which is redundant, sorry, USAP, the P is process, sorry, bad habit. Um, but what came out of USAP is actually the obliteration of half of that strategic plan, I think 60%. 60%. Jeff did this great analysis of all the different goals within Strategic Plan 2020, and 60% of them are simply ignored in the USAP recommendations that came out in May and that we're now pushing forward with. Um, among those is internationalization of our curriculum. Think about that. That's a major goal of Strategic Plan 2020, and yet we're cutting French and German. Um, interdisciplinarity, but we've cut one of our only interdisciplinary bachelor degree programs on campus, which is women's studies. We say we value diversity and that's in, that teaching students about diversity and um, having an institution that values diversity is an important part of our mission and yet we cut women's studies, um, which is one of the you know, only majors where you're pretty much exclusively focusing on diversity um, as a factor in our social structures, with the exception of maybe some work that you do in your language studies majors, right? Um, so, so, in fact, you could argue that the cuts that are being made are counter to, that undermine our progress towards the um, mission of the university. And um, Nancy Virtue at Senate asked this very question of the chancellor, which is, wouldn't it make more sense? Because the chancellor will be the first to acknowledge that half, that 60% of the goals of our strategic plan are being ignored at this point. And Nancy Virtue said, well, wouldn't it make sense before we cut anything to actually start paying attention to the other 40%? So we know that we're not cutting things that we actually need in order to meet the goals of those other 40%, the other 40% of the document. There's no good answer to that, right? You have to, you have to pay attention to the whole document before you make radical decisions about programs to cut and slash. And the other thing I just want to say, and I'm sorry if I'm hogging the microphone, but you know, one of the things you're being promised again and again and again is that just because we cut the major doesn't mean you're not going to have access to classes in French, German, women's studies, geosciences. And I'm here to tell you that do not believe that. Do not fall for that for one second. I, and if you don't believe me, just look at the schedule we have a bunch of prefixes at IPFW in things that you know we once thought would be great to have. We like the symbolic idea of having them, but we invest no money in them. We've stripped them entirely of any structure, structural support or administrative uh, uh, support. So things like the LGBTQ certificate, things like the Peace and Conflict Studies certificate, all of these things, you know, basically dwindle into nothing when you take away the actual faculty support and administrative structure for them. And I predict the same will um, happen eventually with all of the things that are now um, have been cut. Um, you know, think about it too in terms of faculty recruitment. When you bring faculty, one of the ways you get faculty to come to a job is you give them opportunities to teach in their discipline and their ma in to, to students in that major. It's what, it's, you know, it's what we sort of got into this whole endeavor to do. If you have you know, disciplines that have no students here actually committed to the study of that discipline, you're not going to recruit great faculty to come here to teach. Um, so so you know, minimally, you might have an intro to women's and gender studies. That's what they're talking about when they say they're going to promise you a class. But I would challenge you to even you know, go and look. For example, the, L the intro to LGBT studies you know, used to be offered regularly, yeah, not so much anymore. It doesn't have dedicated faculty whose time is devoted to the teaching of that. Um, and so we really have to think about the commitment here with diversity, right? You can't, you can't strip your programs that have resources to focus on diversity. You can't strip the resources from them and then expect diversity to still happen in the curriculum. It's just not going to happen. 
want to say a little bit, well, I, I just wanted to respond to Janet's comment about the strategic plan because um, I really gave a lot of time to the USAP process. I do it too. Um, in the first year. I mean, it was a very, very time-consuming committee, and uh, the task force worked well together. We were trying to build something that would be better than the Dickinson process for IPFW, and one of the things that seemed to me very promising was this idea that for the first time at IPFW, well, the way it used to be was that there would be a strategic plan, and people would write it, and then they would, I don't know, well, they put it at work. What? There was actually a committee that was supposed to monitor progress for it. It was called SPARC. They quite often didn't meet. They quite often didn't meet. So then six years later, it's time to write another strategic plan. And then six years later, it's time to write another strategic plan. So the, the vision was that, well, we actually have a pretty comprehensive strategic plan that is laying out areas for growth in order to really become who we think we are. Um, and the idea was that each of these areas would be tracked. So different people across campus were going to say, here's how we're going to be meeting this goal in the strategic plan. And there would be an analysis done that would say, well, are we on pace? Can we get everything done that the strategic plan says we'll do by 2020? And that just fell, it just stopped. I mean, that, that analysis um, it, it became it's just, I, as far as I can tell, almost completely forgotten by the second year. There was some analysis of the first year, but the second year when the focus was on <coughs> prioritization and restructuring, if not eliminating programs, that idea that, hey, we're, we, are, uh, we are strategically aligning. We are a process for aligning strategically with our strategic plan. Let's get there by 2020. That was just gone. And that was the thing that I think had some promise. Right, so I want to uh, address something that you also hear out there in uh, public statements, the idea that these are sort of small cuts, they'll affect a small number of students. Um, I want to ask the, the rest of the panel, uh, what will happen to IPFW and by extension the larger region if these cuts go forward? And if you'll forgive me, I'll give an example from uh, my own discipline. I'm the Director of International Studies, so by the efficiencies we've been talking about, we're, we're the largest certificate at IPFW in, in co-ops. <coughs> Trade that back and forth with gerontology, but I'm going to say we're the largest. We to be um, if these uh, cuts and reorganizations go through as they're planned, uh, so we're an interdisciplinary program that relies upon departments and programs like political science, like history, etc. So we have to sort of rely upon all the rest. And I'll ask you to consider the way in which the university is a sort of garment, and when you start pulling on threads on that garment, it unravels pretty quickly. So in our case, 13% of the classes accepted for international studies credit will presumably disappear if those programs scheduled to be cut are cut. If you think about it in terms of those that are just being reorganized and restructured, 37% of international studies uh, accepted classes are affected by this. It's even worse, however, if you talk about the diversity that Janet is talking about. So, like COAS, international studies has a non-Western requirement. So, a very important element of a liberal education, right, to get outside of the Western, um, you know, mindset that we are sort of largely trained in here. Currently, 43% of the classes taught in international studies that are for the non-Western program are done by the, the programs that are scheduled to be reorganized or cut. 43%. I'll throw this out. I'm not averse to being projecting a little bit into the future. If history and political science, as the original September 19th memo expected them to do. If, they're, if they were to be reorganized, and I have no doubt in my mind, others might not share my pessimism, but this stuff is in the mail, folks. If you think you're not being affected, I almost guarantee you, five years down the line, come talk with me. If poli-sci and history are affected with these other programs, 27 out of 28 of the non-Western programs would have been affected by the 19, September 19th plan. That's a massive, biggest, biggest certificate in COAS, 
We're talking about the non-Western component of that. That's a horrific outcome, and one that clearly hasn't been thought through in any, in any great, uh, to any great extent. So I'll uh, from my perspective, I'll go back into my moderator hat. What happens if we cut these programs that are supposed to impact minimally, that only affect small amounts of students? I'm, I'm going to start on that, and I'm actually going to get us back to something that's come up numerous times. What do you think the purpose of education is? Or more specifically, what do you think the purpose of education at this institution is? If the purpose is to have folks who graduate from professional programs, who go out and can find a job that's directly associated with the degree, you know, I, I have a, an accounting degree, so I will go become an accountant. It's kind of hard to find uh, a job that says women's studies, to go with uh, examples. It's kind of hard to find one that says political science. That's what you're getting a job in political science. There are jobs that exist for degrees, and they line up quite beautifully. And if that's what you think the purpose of education at this institution is supposed to be, then philosophy courses, women's studies courses, uh, program, or courses out of visual performing arts, become simply foundational courses that provide a general education, a breadth of education, with no need for anyone to be able to take a course up higher, a 300 level course, a 400 level course, actually earn a degree in that. So if that's what you think the role of the university here at IPFW is, then in many respects what Lachlan has pointed out is not a problem at all. In fact, you can sort of say we should accelerate to the point that we get there faster. If, however, you say that the purpose is a comprehensive institution, then that's problematic. And so the question becomes, what's the purpose of this place? I'm going to take a, I, I agree with everything Amy just said. Um, I sense a butt. <laughs> no, 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 I'm trying to think about the for me, I care deeply about all the individual programs that are being named. And I would also like to point out, we, we've talked a lot about five programs. 25 academic programs are being cut as part of this, just so we're all clear. The, the five are the ones that were the most recent significant additions that weren't on previous versions of this list. But I want to make sure we're paying full attention to this. 25 academic programs from across the university are being cut as a result of this. Um, but I think the other thing for me that I find deeply troubling is it's not so much that we're losing French. It's not so much that we're losing women's studies. It's not so much that we're losing any of the individual programs as, pro as programs. But I think what's really d distressing for me about this, and this gets to the idea, what Andy was talking about, the idea of what, the, what is the purpose of education. To a certain extent, like if you're coming and you, I'm going to be a nurse and so I'm going to major in nursing and I'm going to be an accountant so I'm going to major in accounting, I mean, those are perfectly laudable, important tracks. I don't want to make it seem like I'm denigrating those. But for a lot of students, they come to college and don't know what they want to be. And that's, to a certain extent, what the purpose of college was supposed to be. It's not about preparing you for a job. It's about preparing you for citizenhood. It's preparing you to be an adult in the world. It's pre pre preparing you to be a contributing member of society. And so part of that isn't so much what matters deeply as the specific thing you get a degree in, but it's the fact that you go through the process of learning. You go through the process of learning how to think. You go through the process of learning how to learn and learning how to exist as an independent person in the world. And one of the things I think is especially important about the student population at IPFW is, I mean, I'm in the history program and I'm sure that everyone up at this table can testify the same thing. I end up seeing a lot of students who, who, by the time they get to history, it's their third, fourth, fifth major at IPFW. They, they move from thing to thing, and there's nothing wrong with that. Taking a class and having your curiosity sparked is the purpose of college. And one of the things that's going to happen by eliminating all of these different programs is that you're eliminating the ability for students to be sparked. You're eliminating the ability for students to find the thing that's right for them. We're going to lose students. Not, I mean, losing these... Educational offerings, losing these programs is devastating for the university. But losing the ability for these students to be sparked and to find their right home and to find their right path is devastating. We're going to lose a lot of students as a result of this. They can point to the numbers and say, these five programs only have 81 majors. And it's like, okay, fine, that's a number. That's a legitimate number. But at the same time, it's a completely irrelevant number. Because how many students became geology majors for two semesters and then moved on to something else? 
How many students took three different majors before they got to philosophy? If you take away the links in the chain, the chain falls apart. I mean, it's the pulling the thread idea that Lachlan talked about earlier. But if you take away the ability for students to find the things that motivate them and drive them, you lose those students. You lose their ability. You lose that spark that would be created in them. And I think that's, that's devastating. And by the way, I'll quickly throw in there four programs that, that, that Jeff mentioned, like nursing, accounting, etc. Even those, I should say even those, it sounds awful. Even those programs want to see breadth in the education. You know, you take classes to learn how to communicate with people, to think critically, because you may not be a nurse for the next 50 years and then retire. You may not be an accountant for the next 50 years and retire. And you know what? Even if you are an accountant for the next 50 years or an engineer, you still have to know how to talk with people. And you, know how to, you need to know how to think critically. And as technology evolves and our jobs evolve, you need to be able to grow with those. And so the professional programs, it's not that the professional programs say, you know, we don't want these other things. The people who look at a university and say, it's a place to prepare the professionals, even, even that perspective says those professionals need to develop these skills that Jeff was talking about. So I want to actually go back and answer the original question, but then I also want to build off of this question of the, of the bar arts. But, so first, just to use women's studies as an illustration, because we're an interdisciplinary degree, we actually pull um, from different departments. Our classes are actually pulled from different departments, which actually is kind of interesting to think about that as a model of efficiency, right? Um, but so the, set that aside. Um, once you close the women's studies major down, there will be a what I would think of as a ripple effect across all the disciplines on this campus, all the departments on this campus that we currently support. So in other words, our majors, for their major requirements in women's studies, are taking classes in communication, in psychology, in English, in history, in political science. What's going to happen is those classes that we've been populating are going to struggle to exist within those majors now. So if you're a comm major and you really like that gender roles and communication class or the women, men, and media class, don't count on that class anymore because those classes already were low and rolling for that discipline and the only thing that pushed them over the, the minimum seat requirement are, were the women's studies majors who took them. So the, the, um, to me, the tragedy beyond losing the women's studies major here at IPFW is diversity across the curriculum is going to suffer because it was women's studies who enabled that diversity, who's, who who buoyed it up, and who frankly kept pressure on departments to make sure that that diversity was there in the curriculum. Um, and so that's a real um, loss to this entire campus. Um, without us, the LGBT certificate cannot exist. We, are, we contribute the majority of the classes for that certificate. We contribute to international studies. Health and Human Services has two concentrations focused on diversity and gender and women's studies that we provide almost all of their courses for. So we actually have, a, we might be tiny in terms of the number of majors we have, which today I was looking at the sheet are around 30, um, with another additional 30 so minors, but we have our fingers <laughs> in everything across this campus, and all of that is about to come unraveling. Um, but the other thing I would say too about you know, so we talk a lot about liberal, edu liberal arts education as being sort of foundational, right? It's what you get through your general education. But I want to make an active defense for the actual liberal arts majors. So your English majors, your, your um, women's studies major, your French major, um, your so sociology major. What we're doing on this campus by, by moving away from those core, what have historically been um, important core majors at a comprehensive university is, is actually, we're, we're, we're going in the opposite direction from the trend. So one of the things we know is that employers more and more are valuing a liberal arts education over a professional studies education. And part of that is the nature of our economy. We know that people are gonna probably, through the course of their adult life, change career tracks two or three times. And what a liberal arts degree does is give you the ability to navigate that changing economy and those changing career um, dynamics. 
And it's interesting because just about, a, what, maybe a week after um, the cuts here were made, the um, uh, Wall Street Journal came out and, um, with some data about the liberal arts degrees. And um, in terms of earning capacity, the two largest growth areas for earnings for, liberal, for, for um, majors, for, for the major you graduate in, are area studies, including women's and gender studies. Um, and the second major growth area is language studies, so French and German. Um, so this is a very short-sighted uh, approach that we're taking. We ought to be investing and pushing students into liberal arts degrees. Um, it's frankly in their best interest in many cases if it's, if it's well suited to what they want to study. I think one of the things that has frustrated a lot of us on this campus is the actual discouragement of new students in terms of concentrating their studies in liberal arts degrees, and particularly the humanities. Um, there's, I'm going to go, I'm just going to say it, there is, an, there is a bias on this campus um, that discourages people from studying things that don't have direct career paths, say, you know, as, as I think Andy said, you study accounting, you become an accountant, you study nursing, you become a nurse. Um, if, if, it's almost as if, because there's not one single career path, we've discouraged students from going into it, but one of the virtues of a liberal arts degree is the ways you can carve out your own career path um, and the sort of breadth of options that are available to you. I see wincing and everything, so maybe we should um, turn it into some questions from the audience. I think some people in the audience aren't buying the argument, but there's lots of data to support it. I'll just say one thing really quickly. Um, in Janet's comment about the... I'm going to keep doing this. Janet's comment about how the curriculum will change and be uh, somewhat impoverished in terms of diversity I think it's also true for campus culture. I want to give credit to Janet as the director of Women's Studies and to student groups who are affiliated with it. I'm a Women's Studies affiliated faculty member and I've been on the co-curricular uh, committee planning Women's History Month, planning one book things. It's not just Women's Studies, but um, other programs that are creating part of our campus culture, intellectual life, lectures and conferences and, um, you know, readings and art events, these things are going to go away too. So there will be uh, also less diversity in terms of the options for um, what you can come to campus to experience. Any questions? You can't advertise those things anyways though, so what difference does it make? I want to suggest we flip something for just a moment. We have talked, uh, uh, Janet just made a nice appeal for liberal arts majors, not just liberal arts education. I think that there is another way to be looking at this, and that is that it, it's not just that the liberal arts provide courses for professional programs. There really should be an attempt to try and bring those together in ways that we do not right now. Uh, for example, if somebody actually uh, earned a degree in communication, or if they earned a degree in English and also had some programming skills, that actually makes them quite intriguing to employers. If somebody is uh, an accountant, or excuse me, is a, is a uh, political science major, but actually understands what civil engineers have to do, governments will suddenly say, you are an interesting person, we would like to hire you. Now, that does, of course, mean that the person who's looking for work, it does, they have to carve out their, their, their career, as Janet said. What I always tell political science majors when they, when they decide they have to start looking for a job after uh, school, is not to look for jobs that say VA in political science. Instead, write down the skills. Write down the things that you liked to do. What's the analysis you liked? What's the statistics? Did you like writing and creating a message? Go look for those skills. Because what you'll actually find is there are jobs looking for those things. Now imagine for a second, you take the person who can develop a message, who can uh, do some analysis of, of legislation, and add to that the ability to create a database that also then mines data elsewhere, that becomes incredibly valuable to folks. So what we're really, uh, what we really, in my opinion, should be looking at is a better integration entirely across the university. Not that one part is supportive of the other, but that they actually work together to create a better whole, I would argue. Programs, like, don't send the other programs, but why at this point is women's studies because like this is just starting to be like so widely accepted and so
so many people are taking an interest in it now. So why? <laughs> because I don't understand. Well, obviously Janet would want to answer this one, but I'm going to jump in in front of her quickly and say, <laughs> good question. And I'm betting none of us have a good answer for that. As Janet said earlier, the metrics don't necessarily match up to the recommendations. It's small. I mean, at the, they basically just said, what are the 25 smallest programs on campus on a certain level? And let's just cut off from the bottom. That's small in what way? Yeah, uh, Janet already demonstrated that that's not small. Grants. It's small, it's, but it's small. It, it's it's major. Small in number of majors, small in number of graduates, small, I mean, it's, it's small. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with yeah. being small. I think it's stupid to, I think what they've done is dumb. But, <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's small. So this is the one program that really sort of teaches diversity. So, yes, you could say that it's small, but I think there's also... But you're, but you're trying to attach value to a decision that's about size. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, like that's that's the point. Is that their argument is that it's small and an inefficient use of resources, and so the coming back at it by saying, "But it's valuable," doesn't address the it's small thing. And I'm, I'm again, I agree with everything you guys are saying. I'm just saying, like, at, at a certain point, they're not listening to fix the small thing, is what they would say. Well, and one thing I would just add is that um, actually the trend nationally is that women's studies is growing in the sense of. Um, in the past four years, universities have actually chosen to invest. There are more faculty lines have been added to women's and gender studies programs nationally um, in the past four years than we've ever seen. Um, the the um, you know in terms of measuring, so, so yes, yeah, so we're small. I mean that is the, the short answer to the question. I mean the frustrating thing from my perspective as a program director is that there's no context for that size, right? There's no explanation for it and um, that's being accounted for. And so, for example, if you just flip it around and you say, okay, let's look at the number of full-time faculty committed to that unit per major, suddenly we become one of the most efficient units on campus. I mean, so we have 30 majors today, one full-time faculty member. I'll, I mean, very efficient. I mean, so so maybe you know within the College of Arts and Sciences, our closest competitor would be something like communication, which is one of the largest majors in COAS. Um, and I, the last time I did their calculations, I think there was one, uh, 22 majors for each faculty member as a ratio. Um, so yeah, and you know one of my arguments all along has been you got to invest in it to grow it. Right? And so if you look at IU South Bend's Women's and Gender Studies program, it's, it, it would pass the threshold that's been set for surviving at IPFW. But it also has three full-time faculty members. Despite it being a smaller campus, it's a bigger major. Um, you know, there's a lesson to be learned here that um, interest follows resources. Right? And we learned that with Title IX and women in sports. If you invest in it, people will come to it. Um, and so that's been frustrating from my perspective as somebody who's been trying to develop a program is, you know, you cut off all your avenues to growth when you cut off all your avenues to actually having resources. Um, well, and it also begs the question, if the metric such as it can be determined is just small programs, small numbers, why did we go through the years of study and time that were devoted to this, isn't that massive inefficiency on the part of not the faculty? No, no I want to make two quick points. I'm sorry, I see hands going up. First of all, uh, a lot of people have simply vilified USAP, and that is not fair. There, there are people who invested many, many more hours than I'm betting most of us in this room would be willing to invest in any single process. The database that has USAP information in it is full of wonderful, wonderful information. Goals that departments have accomplished, that programs have accomplished, things that we should be celebrating. So to simply vilify USAP I think is inappropriate. Secondly, there's nothing wrong with trying to measure things and to see how they're doing. The problem is relying too heavily on those measures. Uh, I tell students all the time when they ask, uh, you know, what's the right answer to this question, I tell them there are lots of right answers to the question. Don't rely on one bit of data to, to come up with your answer. So the idea that we would look at 
the number of majors or the number of people, the number of jobs equally associated with a, with a, a major, that's fine. But then let's also take a look at number of majors per faculty member. Uh, you can't pick metrics that are only going to judge based on a, a common theme. Last academic year, the faculty leaders, Janet, Mark, uh, Masters from Physics and I, wrote a two and a half page memo uh, discussing the flaws we saw in the metrics. 30 questions. 30 questions of what we saw as problems with the metrics. A response like two of them. With a, the preface by, I'm not going to be responding to all of these. <laughs> So, um, kind of going along with that, so we have this whole discussion about um, all these cuts and what they entail, but um, how final are these things? Are they like 100% going to happen and then going along with that, um, when will we see them take the most effect or when will they be finished? I'm going to throw one date out that we all need to keep in mind. November 15th was actually the deadline by when uh, we were supposed to have a better feel. People were, were allowed to provide feedback on Action Plan 41, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people have forgotten about that date because of the Purdue Board of Trustees sort of stepping in and saying this is what needs to happen. Uh, without providing a lot of direction about what this is other than to cut more. So there, there's a lot of gray in things. However, what we do know is that January 1st is when a lot of programs are, will be, well, are suspended. And well, but actually October 18th was when admissions, I mean, you could right. no longer yeah, focus right. majors, but on the October 17th, Carl Jonah did reiterate November 15th as a deadline for providing feedback. So it sure looks final when you can no longer declare that major, but supposedly if everything changes on November 16th, then suddenly it'll be like a bad dream and you can declare that major again. And actually, so the, the admissions to... Uh, uh, women's studies, French, German, etc. were suspended October 18th, but students we had put in the system as women's studies majors on the 17th were then booted out. In terms of how final it is, as, as Andy alluded to, that there's theoretically the possibility for change. There's been, I've seen, heard no indication that anything that's been proposed to this point as being a cut will be reversed. It's possible something could change, but we're talking, but I, I, I doubt we'll see much, if anything, in the way of change in the short term. Well, one of the tragedies here is that we're looking at basically a carrot or a, a stick only strategy for restructuring. <laughs> uh, what's the incentive for a department to go to, I mean, public policy had three things suspended. What's the incentive of anyone to go to public policy and say, what can we do? What's a partnership that we can try that would actually preserve those programs? Hey, I'm not on the cut list. I'm not going to go talk to anybody. I mean, that's an unfortunate reality here. And that gets back to our financial problems. We come back every year to the need to, for, to, the need to cut, to get into the black, which means we're never setting aside any money that can be used for what Jeff likes to call strategic budgeting. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, so in the midst of strategic planning, the, the USAP um, recommendations, was, was there any, uh, any looking at the expenditures on, I'm going to use athletics, um, which kind of we understand is a, a large expenditure and kind of has been the target of a lot of criticism. So was athletics seriously considered as a place for restructuring and uh, making cuts, or was it kind of exempted and off the table in the process? It's included as a recommendation in the year two. Determine what an appropriate level of investment in athletics is. Yeah. And we haven't heard a lot about that. But Action Plan 41 reaffirms the commitment to Division 1. Yeah, the, the problem is that was a really poorly written recommendation because the, the title of the recommendation didn't line up with the body of the recommendation. And the administration chose to respond to the body of the recommendation rather than the you know community building exercise. That, so. So, a couple of things. Um, no, but part of, the, I mean, part of the problem is we were in the middle of a process. Action, the Action Plan 41 stuff, the, academic, the original academic restructuring proposal, we were in the middle of a process to working our way through all this stuff. 
Now, the original September 19th recommend, academic restructuring recommendations were going to close a series of programs that had zero, one, two students in them. I mean, they were tiny, tiny, tiny programs. And in most of these cases, it was like biology has five programs, and now it's going to have three programs. So students who were interested in being, you know, or like chemistry, if you were interested in being chemistry pre-dental, you could still become bio pre-dental, or you could get chemistry something else. So there were still options within the general field you were interested in pursuing. Um, and so academic cuts were going to get made, but then we were still in the process of engaging in a broader discussion about what the rest of the university was going to look like. The faculty leaders were pushing hard on the administration to engage in a serious conversation about the future of athletics and our investment in athletics at the university. We were pushing hard about engaging in a serious study and assessment of administrative bloat at the university, things like this. Um, the board of trustees stepped in and said, eh, cut. And so that kind of halted or put in the background any other efforts to have a broader based discussion about the future of the university. The faculty leaders are still trying to push some of these other conversations, but at this point it's not about let's have a conversation about athletics or administrative blow to save these programs. Let's wait and have a comprehensive discussion about our budget before we make these permanent changes. Now it's let's have a comprehensive, I mean really at this point I've said this to multiple administrators, it's we need to have a comprehensive conversation about our budget to prevent these cuts from coming to future programs. We need to get the rest of our budget under reasonable control in order to prevent this from happening another round where rather than eliminating the smallest programs, now we're going to start eliminating the sociologies and anthropologies and political sciences and histories and Spanish and whatever else. So when the Board of Trustees came and said, cut, they said cut purely from academic programs. Well, they said, they saw the, uh, the LSA study focused on our academic operations. Uh, USAP issued 41 recommendations, uh, three of which were really specific saying, and I'm going to shout for a moment, so don't get excited when I shout, you spend too much money on academics! Maybe other stuff needs to change too, we're not really sure, but you spend too much money on academics! And so when, when the Board of Trustees looked at USAP, they saw you spend too much money on academics, and maybe some other stuff needs to change, but we're really not really sure what that should be, and maybe you should look at some, like athletics, maybe we should spend less money, and maybe you should cut the number of administrators, but oh my god, there's 13 departments that you need to restructure right now. And so again, when they looked at it, they saw, oh, LSA said we have academic problems at IPFW, and USAP, this internal study, said you have academic problems at IPFW, so let's talk about the academic problems. We should keep in mind that for five years in a row, we've come back to cuts, and there have been cuts virtually everywhere on campus. Jeff has actually been trying to get uh, central administration to come up with a list of those cuts so we can actually have some idea of what has happened over those five years. Believe it or not, they don't have a nice centralized list of them right now. When they put it together, we may, we may look at it and say, oh my gosh, we didn't realize they cut that much out of that. Or we may say, holy cow, that thing was never touched. We don't know because it doesn't exist. Uh, I'm a music major here at the university, and one of the, the proposed changes by 2018 I saw on the list was that the uh, EPA, the Visual Forming Arts and Fine Arts Departments, would then merge. Do you guys know what that would entail? Or That's VCD. What, That's a typo. Oh, that was a typo. VPA should have been VCD. Okay. Yeah. So you were right in the way you read it, but it was incorrectly written. Okay. So. Why do we need liberal arts skills? <laughs> just, uh, just saying. And just to be clear on that one, that's a faculty-driven process to merge those departments in their curriculum. So that's, that one's not even being imposed from anyone else. They, they moved forward that process. Oh, okay. It has to do with accreditation and curriculum and faculty expertise and things like that. So, I mean, that's actually a good thing when you take out the typo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to Jeff's point, um, I, I actually I was wondering if anyone has had any discussions about how much money we spend on academics relative to the rest of our overall budget. So my um, review of the data that IPFW we have produced and data the federal government shows that we spend around 39% of our overall budget on instruction. And of that 39%, there's quite a bit less that we actually spend on salaries and wages uh, per, per faculty. Um, that seems low to me. Um, and that seems at least a couple of percent, percentage points lower than um, 
what the institutions that IPFW itself designates as their peers um, and what they spent on, on that instruction. This is why we need to have a, a conversation about administrative load, and this is why we need to have a conversation about uh, our, our level of investment in athletics. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to be the guy who comes in and says all the data you've been citing to justify your arguments are wrong, but like the, this chart has been produced that shows a number of administrators on campus now exceeds the number of faculty on campus. And the problem with that chart is that there have been people in who've been, part of it is just the way human resources classifies particular jobs on campus. There have been a variety of positions on campus that used to be labeled as like staff or clerical positions on campus that because of prior years of budget cutting, people have been given more responsibilities and suddenly their job turns from clerical or staff into administrative. So in some cases, it's not that we've actually added new administrators to the campus, it's that we've given people more responsibilities without necessarily increasing their pay. And so now they are classified as administrators. And so, and, and so part of the pushback I've heard from administration on something like this is you can't just say we have administrative bloat without actually sitting down and figuring out who we have working here and what it is they do. Are they contributing? And so one of the things that's going on right now is we're, they're conducting an administrative census where they're literally looking at every single position listed in the HR handbook for us figuring out which ones we actually have people in. They've already actually eliminated 100 uh, empty positions um, from the catalog saying we, we haven't had people in these for years and we're not going to, so let's just get rid of them. Um, and then for stuff that remains, who's working in it, how much money do they make, and what do they do? And now let's have a meaningful conversation about our level of investment in these kinds of things. I have received a commitment from the administration that we will have a meaningful conversation about our level of investment in athletics. I don't know what the outcome of that conversation is going to be, but they've, they've said we will have it. Um, and so, you know, and, and on Monday I'm going to go in and say, all right, you told me last week we're going to have this conversation. Let's start the conversation. Um, but, so they haven't, we haven't specifically asked them that, but we're trying to get at some of these issues. Courtney, she's been trying to ask a question all night. So I was just wondering if those of you, now I know I've had conversations with you know all of you about this stuff, and I might, and we might not all be in agreement on this. So I was wondering if you could address this overall question, which is might be confusing to people in the audience. So there's faculty at IPW that have a perspective. There's the administration meeting, the chancellor and vice chancellor of academic affairs that are making decisions about cutting academic programs. Then there's the board of trustees of Purdue University. So listening to you guys talk tonight, it might, uh, it might, contradictory impressions might be coming out of various things that you said. So for example, I've heard it said that the Board of Trustees stepped in um, at, the, at the 11th hour and overturned, basically, the USEP recommendations. Um, or not overturned them, the trumped them or something. What's, what's September 19th. And actually, what they said was they don't do enough. They didn't they overturn them. Do they don't do enough. There's a difference between overturning and saying that just doesn't go far enough. Well, they did overturn. We like, we like what you've done. Do more. Yeah, yeah, except what we did was contrary to what the September 19th recommendations were in some cases. So saying restructure women's studies with sociology is the September 19th recommendation. October 18th comes along, and it's eliminate the whole program, including the major. So... It, it, it's a little it, bit. Of, it's a little bit of both. It overturned yeah. certain things. recommendations. Yeah, for yeah sure. and I guess I'm speaking from the perspective right. of someone whose recommendations were utterly decimated. You know, yeah. so um, so can you just address this unholy relationship between these three different entities? Because my my feeling about this is that we have been utterly failed by our administration. That. Um, that the administration itself has been disrespected. Its own, its own USAP process, which you know, for all its wards or whatever, was our process, and now the board, the board of trustees comes in, and I don't understand why our administration, or I don't respect, I guess, why our administration has just folded to this. Um, and I think there might be a range of perspectives on that. Um, and I thought I would raise it to 
see if the panel can address that. Could I, I want to say something that hasn't come up. It's something that Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs Carl Drummond mentioned in October, and that then on a couple of different occasions he has walked back. So it's not something I think that he would stand here and say, yeah, I totally mean that. Um, but it was a very compelling thing when he said it, which is why I wanted to repeat it. He said at the Senate meeting of the Faculty Senate on October 17th that the reason that the cuts were not big enough, and this goes back to something Jeff mentioned, these cuts are not about getting us in the black, these cuts aren't about our little fluctuations in cash flow, but that these cuts have become in service to making an attractive uh, exchange of assets agreement between IU and Purdue. So we are barreling toward a split between IU and Purdue, and the health units will go with IU, and everything else will go with Purdue. And as it turns out, the most profitable units in terms of tuition dollars coming into the university are all going to go with IU, or that's the perception. Um, and so Purdue, this is what he said on October 17th, and then he walked it back, but he said Purdue didn't want to feel like they were getting a turkey. Um, and so it's not just that we have to make cuts that make our current situation look good, we have to make cuts that make whatever is left over after profitable health departments leave, make that a good enough deal for Purdue to feel like they're getting something good. Purdue and IU both need to feel like they are winners of this uh, discussion. Whether we feel like winners is not actually that important. And that's why I think I agree with you that the entire campus, including its leadership, is being treated with a lack of respect. One thing I would add, though, is, so everything you said, absolutely true. But I feel like where we have failed, in where the central administration of this campus has failed is in pushing back against the LSA recommendations. So, I mean, the chancellor technically voted against them. But then in all her public statements in the months after, basically she suggested that if they could just be tweaked slightly, if the splitting of the campus could just be tweaked slightly, right? It, it, she got real hung up on the idea that nursing would go to IU and would be removed and you know, the rest of us would stay behind. So, so instead of just coming down hard and fast along the line of this is unacceptable, this destroys com uh, comprehen access to comprehensive higher education in Northeast in Indiana, there was a kind of limp fish response. It was like, well, maybe it's not all bad. Maybe we can work, we can just do, tweak this one bad aspect of splitting the campus, right? And, but also I think we all got lulled into a sense of uh, that the LSA, the LSA, the splitting of the campuses was such a bad idea that reasonable people would come around to realize that logistically it made no sense. That you couldn't have students part-time at IU and then part-time at Purdue. Like think about financial aid, right? Think about that. You have to be full-time, right? The federal government is not going to dig around and say, oh wait, but you're part-time here and you're part-time here, I guess you're full-time, right? So there, it just seemed like there were so many foundational problems with the idea of splitting the campus that would never happen. And then I think, frankly, there was a lot of working behind the scenes to make sure that it was happening and that there wasn't full-on resistance to us saying a unified campus. Um, and to me, you know, as outraged as we all might be, and rightly so, about the closing of some majors that we hold dear to our hearts and love and absolutely feel the value of. I am one of the people in the camp that, that says this is just the beginning, that in fact what we're about to see is the complete decimation of a public regional campus in Fort Wayne, and what we're going to become if you um, were at the uh, film, film on Tuesday, you heard Lachlan talk about um, Rose Holman um, and the idea of what a Purdue Northeast campus would look like. and. You know, Rolls Holman, for those of you who don't know, is a private um, school in Terre Haute that focuses on engineering and the sciences and some professional studies. They don't have a single major in the humanities, the social sciences, or the fine arts. They're, they have a total across the campus of 26 majors. Um, 
that's, I think, the vision that, that is being foisted upon us as a campus. And, you know, it works in Terre Haute because Terre Haute has Indiana State University providing a public comprehensive education. We are that role now. We, we fill that role now. If we become the public Rose Holman, there will be nobody in Fort Wayne to provide um, what Indiana State University. Yeah, so Carmine the Chancellor lives. herself has suggested that the idea for moving our campus forward is, you know, once we're split for that for, for basically the Purdue side of the campus would be would focus on the mission, a mission similar to Rose Rose Holman. So okay, so two things. One on that, she says she says Rose Holman, but the thing that's gonna make us distinctive is the fact that we have the liberal arts here. And it's gonna be pairing the engineering with the liberal arts, be pairing the professional with the liberal arts. So just, I think, to, to get back to Nancy's question though, I think that we as a campus are spending too much time worrying about who deserves blame for what happened in the middle of October. And I understand that, because that's the devastating moment we're in. But I also, to a certain extent, think it's irrelevant. And I say that because, when, Andy mentioned this earlier, five years in a row, We've come back to the fall semester and faced a budget deficit that requires cuts. The first semester, the, the first day the chancellor got here, uh, she walked in the door and it was, here's an eight and a half million dollar budget deficit for you, figure it out. Um, that's a massive hole to fill on day one. Um, and, and I mean, anyone who was here at the time remembers how difficult and stressful that first semester, that first year was. Every year since then, as we've prepared our budget for the following year, we've projected a flat budget. And by that I mean we've projected enrollments to remain consistent from year to year. Despite the fact that demographically, the number of high school graduates is staying flat or declining, despite the fact that as the economy has gotten better, more students who are here are going off, going, leaving the university and going back to the workforce, Despite the fact that our, we've actually been doing a better job of graduating students, and so, I mean, in a weird way, when you graduate students more quickly, it means they stop paying you money to take classes with you more quickly. And so, if we had actually started to address some of our fundamental budget problems five years ago, and rather than just making cuts of convenience to get down to balance, and started saying, all right, we're going to face some hard years here, we're going to face some declining revenues over the next few years. Let's start budgeting appropriately. We wouldn't have gotten to the situation we're in now, where we're five years into an ongoing budget crisis, where we're constantly having to make cuts to address this crisis. If we'd actually started responsibly budgeting four years ago, three years ago, we wouldn't need to keep coming back to a discourse of, oh, we need to make more cuts to fill the hole. Oh, we're spending too much money on academics. Oh, we're need to, we need to get more efficient, whatever else. We'd actually fixed the problems, or at least taken more responsible steps to address the problems. We never would have gotten to this moment where the board had to step in and say, no, you need to do more. So I'm not dismissing the importance of this moment. I just think that the blame lies four years ago. But didn't you say earlier that the Board of Trustees actually that this isn't about a budget shortfall, that it's about... But you missed my point. We, that we wouldn't be at the point where they would care about our long-term financial health if we fixed our long-term financial health four years ago. And so four years ago, whose fault was that? <laughs> well, yeah, so right. we are... Who's <laughs> passing Who are you pointing to right now? And the and Chancellor. Then, okay, okay, the buck stops with the, the Chancellor. I just wanted to be clear to everyone in the room that four years we're pointing at the chancellor. <laughs> the, no, that ultimately, but my, my point, Nancy, is that if we had actually gotten the university's budget to a point where we were responsibly budgeted, and we were able to invest in our strategic plan, and we were able to do these kinds of things, we wouldn't have ended up with an LSA report that says, oh my goodness, look at how terrible IPFW is and look, looks, and look how much in the red it is. And we wouldn't have ended up with a USAP report that says, we can no longer afford to be what we have become. We need to cut academic programs and we need to restructure academic departments. If we'd gone back and actually done our jobs four years ago, the timeline would be different. The narrative would be different. Our situation would be different. By the way, the faculty leaders, every one of those years when they were projecting flat or possibly mild growth in enrollment, the faculty leaders, every one of those years said, really, you sure? Is that the estimate you want to use? And every year we were told, oh, yes, yes, yes. So as a parent who is here to 
support my child in the university. Everybody's talking about all of this, but what can be done? If this is all a done deal, what, what can be done? Why are we all here listening and I want to hear all of this. What can be done? I mean, if this is all a done deal, what is everybody doing here? What can be done? I think there are a couple of things that we should be keeping in mind. First of all, um, the programs that are suspended slash eliminated, who's to say they can't come back? If suddenly there is help, if suddenly there's a viable way for that program to grow, but then there is that's... a viable way for it to grow. And we know that from wound studies, especially with recruitment with high school, how we've done, we've reached out, we've done what they've asked us to do, and our program is growing. So I would argue that right now it already is viable. But what I would point out is they're not using this number. What they're looking at is data from a little bit ago. In fact, as I said to the chancellor just earlier this week, if we had used, if we had gone through this process three years ago, Ed studies would have been eliminated. Mm -hmm. So it's about the time period that's being examined. It's not necessarily about the, what's happening at this very moment. So one possibility is that programs could come back. I'm not saying they would, but it's a possibility. Second, I think a, uh, a stronger showing from the administration that is able to go to the Board of Trustees and say, you didn't really tell us how many programs to cut, you didn't tell us how many dollars to cut, but here's what we've done. And we didn't necessarily eliminate as many programs as we said we were going to, but here's how we've aligned everything so that we are now financially more viable, because that matters to you, we're more efficient, because that matters to you, and still we're able to maintain a comprehensive institution in Northeastern Indiana. That's something that the administration would have to do. The, the students, the faculty can put pressure on them to do that, but in the end, it's the will of, I would, I would say, primarily the, the chancellor. She has to be the one who's willing to go to West Lafayette and say, we didn't cut 25 programs, we cut 15, we cut 18, we cut 20, and here's restructuring that we did that's going to make us a better place. So how do you get her to advocate well, for you when she should be advocating for you? When she doesn't even meet with students. Faculty and students cannot change her mind. It has to be community members and parents, and parents as community members. Uh, when faculty raise a ruckus and when students raise a ruckus, it's part of the theater. They, you know, that horrible decision is announced, there's a big bunch of people being upset. It's built into the process, but they don't care. Legislators care about voters, and administrators care about community members who might become donors. I do not feel that, I do not feel that as a faculty member, anyone particularly cares here about what I think. And I don't know how you feel students. Um, I know some students have been just, you know, like bleeding their hearts out trying to improve this and not feeling like their voices are being heard. I don't know about community members or parents or donors who are, well, actually, I do know about some donors who are, um, who are pushing back. But talk to your friends, write letters to the paper. A letter to the paper from a community member counts more than a letter to the paper from me. Can I jump into, on a systemic level, vote, please. There's a couple days left. Think about who appoints the board of trustees. I realize there, on a national level, there's a deep and understandable alienation for voting for the two available candidates for the presidency. But I would argue the governor, yeah. the local, is very, very important when it comes to issues like this. So if you want to see systemic change in these kind of institutions, the governor is often the place that you can be begin because the governor appoints the board of trustees. Look at the history of Purdue, right? Mitch Daniels, Governor of Indiana appoints the boards. The boards then appoint him president of Purdue. Right? That's massive power at that level. So if you disagree with what's happening, and maybe you don't, but if you do, make sure you vote because we're at a place now where there might be change possible. Could we hear from Ashanti? She's been waiting for a while, and then I follow up. Oh, it's okay. I was so sorry. Yeah, I was like, well, one thing that I wanted to say, I don't know if it's necessarily a question. It's probably a question about. But we're hearing that, you know, we, we shouldn't be placing blame. We shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be, you know, um, angry or screaming at like Vicki Carmine or Carl Drummond because it's not necessarily their fault. This is something that was going on four years ago. But four years ago, I don't know about anybody else, but four years ago I was in high school and I came here um, 
to IPMW because I was told certain things. I was told that I would be able to get an IU degree staying here in Fort Wayne. And that's why I came here. That's why my parents sent me here. Um, and then I got into the Women's Studies Department and I was told that I was under the assumption that in three, four, five years, maybe I would graduate um, with a Women's Studies degree. And on October, well, really back in May is when I was starting to hear rumbles that there was issues. But I didn't hear from the university. I heard from uh, brave faculty who weren't afraid to tell me what was going on at my university. Um, and I heard about it all summer. Um, and then it got kind of intense um, at the beginning of the semester into August and September. And then all of a sudden, on October 18th, we're being told the program is eliminated. Um, and so I. I, I'm really just confused as, I mean, she asked as a parent what we can do. Um, I was also going to ask that question um, because it feels like there is a sense of kind of hopelessness. Um, we're, we did a teaching. We did, um, people have been emailing for weeks now. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, as kind of a semi-activist and being hit with being a semi-activist with other activists and being hit with bureaucracy and being hit with apathy from not only the um, the board of trustees and Vicki Carmine who won't even take time to talk to students um, and I'm being told that she listened to a community member before she listened to a student um, who works. Um, uh, who goes to the school that she's the chancellor over? Um, it's. I'm not saying uh, that because I think it's right. I'm saying it because I think it's no, true. No, I understand what you're saying, but I'm, and my problem, my and issue, it does sound is my issue is, um, it feels like we're being kind of people are trying to give us the facts and yet lull us into complacency. And it's like you can't be complacent and you can't not place blame on someone because somewhere somebody made a decision that impacted a lot of people, and it set off a ripple. Um, and I'm looking for somebody to care, and I'm looking for someone to answer questions, and I'm looking for some form of drastic action that we can take so that people will understand that there are people who care, and that this isn't something that they can just do to people and get away with it. Um, because, you know, even going to things like town halls, and people are telling me, I don't know, and uh, uh, people are telling me, uh, we're not sure, and these types of uh, questions, and there's supposed to be people who can answer these questions, and as a student, that's just really disturbing to me, and I'm just looking for a solution, where is our solution um, to, or at least a way to find a solution, and it's looking like nobody knows what's going on. I want to I want to jump in real quick and say I apologize if it seemed like I was saying you shouldn't blame the chancellor or you shouldn't blame blame the vice chancellor because you definitely should. Yeah, um, pretty much saying don't blame. Vice Vice Chancellor Drummond is the one who developed the list of cuts, and you should blame him for the cuts he has proposed making. Vicki Carwine has refused to advocate for IPFW as a comprehensive university to the board of trustees, and you should hold her accountable for that. All right, the point I was trying to make to Nancy is that who's responsible for the particular moment and circumstances of October 18th is less relevant than the broader picture of the financial mismanagement of the university that's been taking place over a broader period of time. But can I, I just want to insert something. So there's the narrative that's been put out there today, right, is that, you know, four years ago the chancellor inherited particularly, four or five, Five years ago, she inherited particularly difficult circumstances in terms of the IPW budget and declining enrollments, and that she's simply reacting to those situations. But if you saw the film Tuesday night, Starving the Beast, you know that the same thing that is happening here has happened at perfectly healthy universities. And what you have are meddling boards of trustees with political agendas. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Right? So if you look, for example, at the University of Texas, perfectly healthy research university, right? But people with political agendas decide that the university needs to operate differently from the way it's operating. And they 
use their force. There's think tanks out there whose entire purpose is to try to disrupt higher education. Um, they think it's too liberal. They, they do not want an educated citizenry. They do not want, they want a docile citizenry. That's what they want. They want an unquestioning, docile public. So think about it. So what happens here in the state of Indiana, right? So I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair to say that, that the agenda being enacted at IKFW wouldn't have happened if we had been healthy five years ago. We would, that we wouldn't have gotten the scrutiny that we're getting now. I think we would have. And I will tell you that from the time Carline got here, she was using language like right-sizing. If you saw that film on Tuesday, guess where that language comes from? Those conservative think tanks, right? There's a whole body of think tanks out there manufacturing this kind of discourse about how to reform higher education. It's not a coincidence that she came in here with that language, right? So whether we had been healthy or not healthy is really beside the point. It doesn't mean we would not have reached this moment where our mission as a university is being, re is being redefined by a select elite group of people with a lot of power. But we also saw administrators standing up to us. Is that is what I'm concerned about too, is because we're being told that the they were not told you have to cut these programs. They're just saying cut something somewhere. And we're being told that, you know, again, that we, uh, you know, yet, uh, being mad about USAP is not, uh, is not conducive. We shouldn't be mad about USAP. But the thing is, clearly certain programs were being attacked in USAP because, I mean, if you look at even at things like marketing, um, with women's studies, I used to be a student worker in women's studies, and I used to hang the uh, the course flyers. Um, and we do a lot of our own marketing. Um, we're not. I mean, if when you're talking, because I went through freshman fest, when IBW is dealing with incoming freshmen, are what are the majors that they are specifically talking about? Are they telling incoming freshmen? We have a really, really cool women's studies program. Go check it out. Yes. No. They're telling people, here's our business department. Here's our nursing department. Here's our engineering building. They're not marketing all the majors the same way. But then they turn around and say, OK, well, your enrollment is low, so I'm getting rid of you. If you're doing all of your own marketing, <laughs> And the university is not trying to help you market your major, then of course if your major is going to be smaller than a major that the university has an investment in marketing uh, to students. And so there was a clear bias and a clear cut um, agenda in making, in making sure that certain programs stayed small and then turning around and cutting those programs. So I understand why why we're being told that USAP is not necessarily bad, or that LSA is not necessarily bad, or that, and there's weird, and I'm still asking. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. You've been going on for a little while. There's at least one person who wanted to respond directly to something oh, you said, I and I have a few to comments. I to what she said about, you know, what the, what the students were told during their freshman orientation. And they were told that all of the, all of the departments and majors were here and repeatedly told that whatever they started with this semester, they would be grandfathered in and be able to finish. That's just this one, one semester, though. What about previous semesters, you know, five years no, ago? No, no, they were lied to because they, they, absolutely. they were flat out lied to. And I was even about a, that. It was a lie that was told over and over to them and to their parents who attended. Can, can I just interject, because Nancy said something really important, and I feel like it, it wasn't, it may have gotten lost, but so when I was going on about, you know, the forces outside of academia that are pushing on boards of trustees to push on universities, what the film teaches us, right, that Nancy said is the resistance came from the administration on those campuses. So it was the campus presidents and the vice provost and the faculty senate presiding officers who stood up and said no, right? And in some cases resigned 
in order to successfully resist those forces. And, and that's an important lesson, right, when we're thinking about how, who's pushing back against that. And I just wanted to make sure that Nancy's comment got heard. And can I piggyback on that? The other thing, that chilling thing that was said by Grover Norquist, who I'm sure you all are familiar with, and he laughed, he literally laughed as he said this, that as this happens in these universities, those liberal arts programs are going to be like people in a lifeboat, and they're going to decide who to eat and who to throw overboard. So that solidarity has to come from within, from the students, from the faculty, from the programs that think they're not going to be affected, because I guarantee they're going to be affected down the line. The yeah. fact that the chancellor was not willing to meet with people is appalling. The communication coming out of central administration is appalling. Terrible. Uh, as students, since you're not able to get the appointments with her, you're not going to be able to convince her. And, uh, no one said, don't try to figure out who to blame, but you know what's going to be more productive? Figure out who can change it. You can go back and figure out who to blame, but if they're not the ones who can change it, then there's not much point in talking to them. You know who the chancellor does have to meet with? The Community Advisory Council. There's a list of them. It's on the IPFW website. They are business owners. They are community members. They're legislators. Find out who they pay attention to, because if they tell the chancellor she has to do this, they're going to, she's going to listen to them. She's not necessarily going to listen to you. And by the way, if there was one way, if somebody had every answer, like you said, you've gone to these and people have not had answers, if there was one answer for all of this, this would be easy and we wouldn't be having this conversation. No one can give you every answer. It's not going to happen. You, you've had your hand up forever, sorry. <laughs> um, expanding a little bit on this idea of these outside of ideological forces um, acting on, on these changes in higher education in general, uh, we're talking about the LSA uh, report and its recommendations as something that is very likely to happen, correct me if I'm wrong. So um, if we are on the verge of IPW being split between Purdue and uh, a part of Indiana University, and will most likely be this university that will be a bunch of other technical professional things plus liberal arts like that extra, and we're seeing that it is likely that um, those liberal arts programs will become more and more and more the foundational basis, the general education basis for the, the real majors that we'll, we'll have here. And if understood correctly, it seems like it is in the hands of the administration to change that and to fight against that. What if the current administration has a complete lack of confidence from its students and from its faculty, and that has been demonstrated? What can happen? Is it possible that we can change the current administration that some way, because of what's happening internally on campus, that the chancellor might be able to step down, or something might change in that sense, or even change the I'm going to say first, anything that looks like or smells like a vote of no confidence has to be something that it, that is shared broadly across the campus. It cannot be something that is driven predominantly by one college. Uh, if it is, then that's something that can be ignored by any decision maker uh, and easily rationalize the ignoring of it. So if that's a direction people want to go, uh, it's important that it be something that have unbelievable broad-based support. That's number one. Number two, most administrators, not every, but most administrators pay attention to things like that and either get fired or step down. Uh, I've never spoken with this chancellor uh, about what she would do if there were a vote of no confidence, so I can't say what she would do in that situation. But one thing for us to remember is that the Purdue and IU boards of trustees have set the December board meeting as the deadline by which they will make a decision. Even if we were to walk over to Chancellor Carwine tonight and hand her a vote of no confidence signed by all 8,000 plus students and all 230 plus tenured faculty members, there's no way there would be a new person in place by the time we got to the December deadline. The reality is Purdue, which is the managing partner of this campus, would send someone either from West Lafayette or pick someone here to take over as the chancellor. And just to add to that, there's no guarantee that whoever would come in after Chancellor Carwine would be an improvement yeah. on Chancellor Carwine. It's just a matter of Chancellor Carwine assuming a position that would protect 
the rest of the programs or these programs or would commit to try to bring these programs back. It sounds very unlikely, but the, the ideal solution coming from heaven would be that Chancellor of Carline would, would uh, assume this position. The, the Community Advisory Council is not a large number of people. If they spoke with one voice or very close to unanimity, she would have to listen to them. Isn't it still true, though, that the Community Council Advisory Board has some overlap with the Purdue Board of Trustees? Yes, there's uh, one member of both the IU and Purdue Boards of Trustees who serve on the Community Advisory Council. The chairman? Uh, the chairman. Currently, the chair of the Purdue Board of Trustees is also on the IPFW Community Advisory Council, and I think is the chair of the Community Advisory Council as well. I can't remember that one for sure. That's actually written into law now. That was one of the changes from 2015. That our that that what what is what used to be a community advisory I forget what we used to call it was changed. Uh, its duties were sort of reworked a little bit so that it would actually have a role more like a board of trustees than what it had previously. In other words, that it should be able to influence decisions more than it did previously. That That's why I'm saying target them. Is it possible then that if not by the November 15th deadline, that at least potentially before January 1st when all of these changes become, you know, concrete in some way, isn't it possible then that we could challenge on a purely um, professional, ethical, legal sort of platform and in order at least to get things frozen, to have some kind of suspension of these changes until those kinds of questions can be addressed? Yeah, but, but your target is not January 1st, it's the December board meetings of the boards of trustees. Yeah, well, and also then the, the, the November 15th deadline. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, it, it does and it doesn't. I mean, it's a deadline, it's one that's been established at IPFW. We, we could decide to ignore it if we wish to, the same way we could choose to ignore the January 1st deadline. But if you're thinking strategically about what to do, don't think in terms of trying to figure something out by January 1st because sometime in December the, the parents are going to say, this is what you are. Yeah. I just, I just want to pipe in and say, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you know, Jeff and Andy, what you're saying about thinking strategically. I take your point about going to the Community Advisory Council because that's who Vicki listens to and, I, and maybe Carl as well. But I'm sorry, I am not convinced that individual faculty members speaking out and, and speaking out in a public way about how this process has played out and the role of our central administration in the process, I think that is equally as important because, you know, you can't tell me that just going and talking to community advisory councils without a lot of sort of public attention drawn to what's, what's taken place and, and what the truth is because you know, I don't know what the community advisors know about this process. You can't tell me that that's not an important piece of this. I didn't say it wasn't. What I said well, was you have to convince the community advisory council. That's who, that's who you have to convince because they're the ones who convince Right, but line. you said that almost as if it's an alternative, a better alternative to what, to what I'm suggesting. And now, what so I'm I saying is you can't, you can't do either one independently. My point was go ahead and protest, but if that's not directed at somebody, then it's noise, and there's more than enough noise going on now. There has to be a concerted effort to make those who can make Vicki change her mind want to do that. That's done in part by visible displays of things. I'm in plenty of community meetings, and I have plenty of people okay. walking up to me now saying, what the hell's going on at IPFW? And that's in part because of the letters to the editor, because of the news stories. That stuff has to keep happening. But if there's no one who is then going to the members of the community, because remember, they meet with Vicki. They don't meet no, with I, the faculty. I, I just didn't hear you saying that clearly before, so I appreciate it. Okay, I just wanted to say quickly that we technically only have a room until 9.30, so we need to take like, a couple more questions and wrap things up. But I just wanted to say thank you so much to the panelists and the impromptu mother. <laughs> thank you very much.
the community and the faculty, but also you are such a powerful voice because you're a collective voice. And don't forget that. That's really important. Woo! Yeah, I, I guess my question, I've, I've asked this to several other faculty members, um, and I haven't gotten a definite answer. It's always been like a theoretical yes. And I, so I don't necessarily expect anything more of this, but I know I personally came to the university with the understanding that I would be getting a IU degree in history. If the LSA goes through, will I still be getting that? What the Purdue Board of Trustees chair said when the LSA report was presented, it was that the degree program you're in, every effort will be made to make sure that's what you finish with. So you are at least a, you know, half a semester into a, a BA in history from IU. Theoretically, according to the Purdue Board of Trustees chair, when you finish in three, four, two, six years, you will, get, you will be handed an IU degree. Now, they will put a window on that. If it really is 10 years from now, it may suddenly become a Purdue degree. But the promise that was made by the Purdue Board of Trustees chair was that if you're in an IU program right now, you're not going to automatically be flipped over to a Purdue. You will finish with the IU degree. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I just want to make a quick follow up to that. Um, no with, with all these things going on, though, can we trust the Purdue board to <laughs> honor that? Like what they said. No one can make you a promise. No one at this table can. The Purdue board of trustees chair can't make you that promise. So if you, if you want a promise, none of us can make it for you. I mean, I, I hate to be that blunt, but you say you've spoken to a lot of faculty members. Let me give you a clear answer. No one can promise you that. And I actually would add one thing. So a local lawyer um, has reached out to me because he has been following everything happening on this campus, and he has grave concerns about the violation not only of faculty rights but of student rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know there's there there. In, in many ways, when you become a student here, you enter a contract with the university. That's your bulletin, right? You're made certain promises through your bulletin. We're not allowed to change. I can't take the WOS major and take it from 33 credits to, th to 40 credits if you came in under the bulletin that said it was 33 credits. I can't make you do the 40 credits. Um, so there are all. It would be good if you did. <laughs> but there are so there are all kinds of ways, right, where you the university has obligations to you, and and so at any point in the process you feel like. Your, their part of that contract is not being upheld, I would encourage you to speak to a lawyer. And that, then we're talking class action would be the best way to go there because then, I mean, they, they could ignore you and try to settle with you, but if there are suddenly 500 people who say, you told me I have an IU degree and now I'm getting this thing from Purdue and I don't want it. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs>